Hallelujah. Come on, somebody give him a hand clap of praise. Yes, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like something's trying to take someone's joy away tonight. I feel like there's something that is trying to rob you of your worship and trying to rob you of your praise. But if you just step out of your comfort zone and, and just kind of slip up your hand just a little bit and say, you know what, God, hallelujah, I've been redeemed. I've been delivered. The devil can't hang nothing over my head anymore. I'm not going to live in condemnation anymore. I refuse to, to lay aside my worship for God. What belongs to him goes to him. What I'm going to do in this service, God, is going to reflect. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Don't let yourself cheat yourself out of a blessing. Grace God. Amen. If you just open up your heart and your mind and and just allow God to do what he wants to do. I believe God will do what he wants to do. But you've got to be receptive to him. And give him your ears and your mind and your eyes and your mouth and heart and everything that is inside of you. Just be receptive. Say, God, if tonight, amen, you got a miracle with my name on it, God, I want to reach out. If you've got a blessing, if you've got a healing, if you've got something, God, amen, I don't want to bypass the, amen, the, the brazing altar. I don't want to bypass the, the Shekinah glory when it falls in. The, I, I want to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. If he's walking by my pew, I want to make sure I chase him like today's my last day to pray. Amen. I want to praise him like today's my last day to praise. I want to worship him, the Bible says, in spirit and in truth. Praise God. Amen. Is everybody happy? Amen. 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 So good to see uh, everybody here in the house of God. Amen. Sister Margarita, we're praying for your husband. Hallelujah. Amen. We're believing God for it. God's going to do a miracle in his life. Amen. Sister Maria, we are praying for you. God's going to God heal your body tonight. He's going to touch you. He did it before. He'll do it again. We're going to believe it. Hallelujah. But I, I, I don't want to uh, get in the way of our speaker. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce to y'all. Well, everybody already knows them, so there's no introduction needed. Uh, they are pretty much a part of this church. Um, we consider them family. Amen. They are like Mau Mau and Paw Paw. <laughs> Amen. But I am, we are blessed uh, to, to have Elder Carl Shirty and his precious wife, Sister Shirty. Sister Shirty, do you have a testimony you want to say tonight? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And if you don't believe that, you can take it to the bank. Praise God, because he is good all the time. Amen. Brother Jim, it's so good to see you back in the house of God, praying for your health as well. Amen. I, I have mentioned, uh, he, uh, I asked if we can pray for him. We're going to pray for him in this service. That God will have his way in his health. Brother Clyde, good to see you, my friend. Amen. In the house of God with us. Amen. And it's just so good to be here. Uh, this is uh, no other place where I'd rather be. Amen. Amen. And so I, I'm, I'm grateful. But uh, I love Elder Carl Shirty. Uh, we call him Bishop. He is uh, an elder in my life, and he speaks in my life. And uh, he, uh, he tells it like it is. He doesn't patty cake with me. He gets on the phone and said, Brother Lankford, this is what you need to do. It's not, hey, this is what I think you need to do. So it's always good to have someone speak into your life that is a mentor, an elder, uh, that has great counsel and wisdom. And so at this time, without further ado, I'd like to bring up Elder Carl Shirty. Will you come and just obey the Holy Ghost tonight? You may be seated. My wife and I both were just a little bit surprised and, and uh, shocked when we realized 
that it has been exactly, exactly one year since we were here. We were here last Father's Day, and Father's Day is Sunday, and don't you ladies forget it. Praise God. I, someone the other day, I, I asked I ask a young lady or a, a mother, I said, uh, uh, is your husband going to get you something nice for Mother's Day? And she said, no. He told me he's not my, my father. I'm not, I'm not his mother. I said, that's stupidity. Praise God. Sometimes you don't, I mean, you may buy your mother a gift, but that woman who has cooked your food and washed your clothes and kept your house and had your kids, she deserves something. Praise God. Oh, that's right. That's right. I don't, uh, of course, I don't really. I, my wife said, what do you want for Father's Day? I, I can't think of a thing. And uh, I'm just blessed. I, I'm not one of those uh, people got to have gifts to feel appreciated. But, you know, we're all, we're all still human. And a lot of people that don't believe in Christmas like Christmas presents, you know. So it's good to be back in Las Vegas, New Mexico. It is good to be back with brother and sister Langford. And, uh, and of course, some of you might know that uh, uh, I was Sister Langford's pastor back before she become a Langford and had nine kids. And, you know, but uh, way back years ago, she came to our church and uh, I... I really, I'd kind of forgotten how long it had been since uh, she had been there. And, and uh, uh, I was talking about an incident today. Of course, uh, uh, I was talking with a man in Florida this morning, and I talked about the danger of being a dreamer. That is my problem. It's a major problem, always been a problem. I mean, my wife and I have been together. Uh, we have been married for almost 60 years come this November, and I still scare her. I'm still saying and doing things that terrifies her. Uh, you know, she just, even, I do things that scare myself. So, you know. But I'm a dreamer, and I'm not ashamed of it. The problem is I'm a kind of person that I like to tell it. I don't remember in 60 years of ministry how many times I've told a joke from the pulpit. I don't remember. I can tell you it's in 60 years it's less than five. I just, I don't do that. But if I can find out anything funny about you, I'm going to tell it. <laughs> Praise God. I don't, I, there's going to be nothing dead, dull, and boring about my life. I'm getting older, and uh, I am. I'm not going to give in to old age. I'm going to. I'm going to fight it right down to the last minute. Hallelujah. So anyhow, once again, a year later, here we are, and I am glad to be here. I I remember one or two people. I don't remember all of you, so uh, uh, I don't want to remember all of you. And of course, since I've been here, brother. I don't know, Brother Bill Yates may have been here twice or once or one time. I don't know. But he's one of my, my kids from Louisiana, and uh, uh, he's doing a great work, and uh, I'm sure he'll be back. Brother, brother uh, Mark Copeland, one of my very dear and best friends. So we have a lot of connections. And uh, I like this building a whole lot better than the last one I was in. I like this. I think this ought to be an apostolic church. Oh, yeah. I can tell right now, y'all don't believe that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anyhow, good to be back in Las Vegas. And uh, I'm not even going to try to tell you what 
Sister Shirley and I have been through to be here. Some, in fact, Brother, brother uh, uh, is it Roger Clack? Rod? Clyde. Right. Brother Roger Clyde reminded me a while ago that when we were pastoring in Augusta, Georgia, that uh, he named it back in 70-something, 73. I don't even look like I'm old enough to have baptized somebody in 1973. But he, he was there. And uh, in, uh, in a little place, of course, we were just outside of Augusta, Georgia, of suburbs, little community called Grove Town. And uh, we started off with a building that would seat probably, oh, I don't know, maybe 150 people. We finally beat the walls out and enlarged it, got it to seat about 250. And after we got... I don't know, Brother brother Clyde, if you were there in that old building back in Georgia. I can't remember where we got together, but somewhere in that time, we baptized him in Jesus' name, and uh, uh, we enlarged the building up to about 250, then we put 510 in it, and you know, so you folks don't, you're going to get no sympathy from me about church growth and a move of God and a great harvest and all that stuff. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to be unkind and insulting, but if I hurt your feelings, the old pastor, I, y'all might remember the Hemp Hill singers, Joel Brisk and all those folks. You might have heard some of their songs down through the years, but uh, uh, that was the church this church and I pastored 30 years, or right at 30 years when we retired just a few years ago. And... Uh, it was a similar situation when we went there. Uh, we took a church that would handle, it would seat about, it would seat probably 350 to 400 people, and we put 600 in that. So uh, once again, I, I'm just a dreamer. And uh, one of the reasons I'm such a dreamer, uh, I still, re- I, I did not realize that Sister Langford was even part of the church in Louisiana in the old building we were in before we built the new one. And uh, we had a lady come into the church right out of the world. She wasn't a Pentecostal. God filled her with the Holy Ghost, and she was blind in both eyes. Beautiful lady, long hair, uh, past her shoulders, very thick and healthy. And uh, she come to church. We baptized her in Jesus' name. She got the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Now, that was wonderful. Then one night, and Sister Langford said she was there, so I've got a witness. My wife was there, Sister Langford was there, and the lady was kneeling at the altar right about here. We were having a prayer service for the church. She was kneeling right about the altar, right about there, and her hair had fallen down over her face when she bent over, long hair come down over her face, and she was praying, normal of course, you know, a real genuine revival church doesn't do anything normal. Y'all still here? Nothing normal. And uh, she was praying, and I happened to walk over. I looked down at her, and the Lord said, when she stands up, she's going to have 20-20 vision. I said, wow. So needless to say, I was watching close for her to get up. And when she got up, she reached up and put her fingers in her face, and everybody in that church thought she was demon-possessed. She went screaming and jumping and carrying on like a wild person. God had given her her total sight back right there just kneeling around the altar. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I I hardly ever make mention to that, and I I had forgotten that Sister Langford was there during that period of time. And, of course, if I started telling you about all the miracles that took place, that's all we would do tonight was that. Hallelujah. And I want to tell it all to you, but the point is I don't want you just shouting over yesterday's miracles somewhere else. I want you to shout over your miracles right now. That be all right? I'm a dreamer. Hallelujah. Oh, 
Oh, praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Langford, for letting us be here and come back for this service. So, if you have your Bibles, you can stand with me for the reading of the Word of the Lord in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6 and verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. I commend you on this Wednesday night, the first night of these, these planned services for the good crowd that is here. And uh, uh, I promise you, and, and I, I really don't even like to say this stuff, say things like this, but I've preached a few times when some things have happened while the word of God was being preached. I mean some powerful things. I've had pastors fall out of the seat out in the middle of the floor more than one time. I've had church congregations fall down between the pews and out in the aisles while I was preaching. But the point is tonight, I am not here to impress you. I am here to share something with you that is going to give you a new vision and help you step up to the next level in your relationship to God. I mean it. I'm not kidding. If I, if I don't preach a dynamic message tonight, if I can just say something to you that will change your life, that's what it's all about. I'm glad my wife is here with me tonight, and uh, uh, it was really a toss-up whether she could come or not. We're both glad she did, and, of course, her relationship to your pastor's wife is another reason she is here. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6 and verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elijah, Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Now, to start off with, as a young Bible reader and a Bible student, I thought that meant it was too tough, too, uh, uh, too demanding, too many rules. You know, it's too straight because I've had some folks tell me that in the past also. Preacher, we just don't believe it's going to take all that to make it to heaven. But that word too straight is not talking about doctrine or lifestyles or none of that. It's talking about the place was too small. Too small. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan and take thence every man a beam and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, go you. And one said, be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So the Bible said that he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he, had, he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, cast it into the cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it. Would the church say amen? amen. You may be seated. So you may have read the story. And like myself, there are a few things here that we could reach a conclusion about this story of Elijah and the sons of the prophet. Now, in our present day term or terminology, we would refer to that place as a uh, Bible school for young preachers. 
And of course, Elisha was the, the main prophet of those days among uh, young preachers, people of God. And uh, they were having Bible school and the crowd got so big they outgrew it. There wasn't room. So they came to Elisha and said, the place is too straight, too small. Can we move over on the river of Jordan and find some trees and cut down some beams and let's build another place. Now, uh, I hope I'm not being too aggressive about what I'm about to say, but uh, this has been a year that uh, Sister Shirty and I came about a year ago, and this is the second time a year later, and uh, I, I'm serious. I, I'm a, I said I'm a dreamer, and it's time for you folks to have a, a place that belongs to you and you call home. It's past time. And somebody's going to have to get desperate to see it happen and start asking God to grant a miracle to see it come to pass. Hallelujah. Uh, see, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to try my best to be careful about what I say because I don't want to put you on the spot too much and these folks that own this place. I'm grateful they're letting you have church here. This is nice. But they said we need a place so we can have church and go to school, learn about the things of God. And Elisha, we want you to go with us. So they all went. I, you know, I was raised in the country. And I know there's some more guys here that was raised in the country. You know, back in the day, uh, I was born before they ever made chainsaws. Now, that, that can speak a long time. You boys today, you teenage boys or young men today, every one of you ought to have to spend a month on a cross-cut saw uh, or an axe. You know, I, I don't know if y'all still use axes or not, but I had to use an axe, and I understand an axe. I understand how it works, and I understand some of the dangers of an axe and sharpening an axe. I understand that. But for that axe head to fly off that handle was not a mistake. It was negligence. Well, y'all got quiet. I mean, you, you guys that use axes all the time, you know what I'm talking about. He didn't put a wedge in the handle. You put a wedge in that handle, that axe head's not going to come off. So we have to be careful about the stuff we work with. We have to protect what we've got. Defend what we've got. I mean, the thing of it is, sometimes when you lose it because of carelessness, you can kill anybody around you. Anybody. But the axe head came off the handle and it was because it was not properly jammed in the head of the handle with what we call a wedge. All right? Now, I've been there and done that, so I know what I'm talking about, all right? I mean, you can chop so long, and that wedge even will work its way out. So you got to be careful. We need to be careful about our prayer life. We need to be careful about our worship. Well, I thought y'all be climbing over the pews about that. Hallelujah. Did you folks know that, that prayer is not spiritual? Did, did anybody in this building realize prayer is not spiritual? Prayer is physical. It gets spiritual results. But when you go to pray, that's not spiritual. It's an act of the flesh to bring the flesh under subjection to the will of God so we can worship God in spirit and in truth. Oh, hallelujah. Worship is not spiritual. It's physical. I mean, there's nothing spiritual about this. It just gets me into a position. After a while, it gets spiritual. Worship begins with a physical effort. And some of you don't do it because you're ashamed. Right? 
you, you, you got to make a trip to a prayer room or somewhere to pray. If you don't, if you don't kill that flesh before you get to the house of God, you're not going to dance in the aisle. You're not going to shout. You're not going to worship openly. You're going to be worried about what everybody thinks around you. Hallelujah. So when they got to Jordan, this man was chopping down a tree right, right near the river Jordan. And while he was chopping down the tree, axe head came off. Now he is holding an empty handle. No axe head. He's not going to cut down trees. He's not going to get anything accomplished. He's not worth anything to the work crew. All he's doing is holding an empty axe handle. All right? Y'all, all right? Are y'all catching? Y'all, I don't know if you're catching on what I'm talking about yet or not. He had to make a decision just like you and I. Was he going to go through the motions and accomplish nothing or admit he lost it and get it back? So I'm going to preach you to you tonight about things we lose that we can't afford to lose and the only way you can get it back is admit you lost it. You got to admit you lost it. Oh, praise God. Can you imagine the crowd looking over there at this guy? No axe head. He got an empty axe head. And you know, the thing about it is, if he did that, oh God, I don't know if I've ever made this statement in my life. There have been a few times that I've made mistakes that the first thing, I, I was wild turkey hunting one day and a turkey gobbled across the river. Well, kind of middle in a uh, 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 river and a very large creek. And uh, I wanted to get over there so bad and hunt that turkey. And I come up on a, a log that didn't have a bit of bark on it. It was as slick as one of these backs of these pews. But I felt, you know, I was young and tough and, I could do it, so I was I was I was crawl crawl dadding or crawl fishing. <laughs> I, I was doing like this, going across that log sideways. I didn't give it any of this because I knew I'd be in that river. So I was just stepping sideways. And about the time I got about halfway across, about the middle of that small river, that turkey gobbled out in the woods just across just across the tree line from me. And the first thing I did when I was trying to get across that log, I turned and did like that. And when I did, I went right in the river. Once I took my eyes off that log, I was done. And I found out it was only ways deep. You're talking about a happy camper? I was happy. I didn't worry about nothing getting wet. I had a buddy that I was hunting with. And as soon as I knew I could stand up in that water about waist deep, I did like this. I just wanted to be sure nobody saw me. I didn't want nobody to see me falling off that log. And so you folks come to, what, what is this? What, what, what's the name of the church? The Pentecostals of Las Vegas. I'm looking at some of you tonight when you walk in here and uh, uh, you're afraid that if you were to fall off your old dead log, somebody's going to be looking and you're going to look around. Oh, I bet you I'm over here. You know, because we, we're ashamed of things that happen to us in a spur of the moment. But the point is, you will never get back. I Listen. Did you get the Holy Ghost when you came to an apostolic church? Did God fill you with the Holy Ghost? You got baptized in Jesus' name and spoke in tongues? Did it happen? When it happened, he filled you with authority and power and anointing. He gave you everything that pertained to him. Oh, hallelujah. Some valuable things along the way. 
we have lost our prayer life. We've lost our worship. You lose your prayer life, you're going to lose your worship. All right, folks. Praise God. We've lost some things along the way that we can't afford to lose. Now, I'm going to say some stuff to you right now that is right and it's real, and I probably said some of this stuff last time. But we have been living in a dispensation without God. We have been living in exile without God or demonstration of God's power for more than 70 years in the past. If you say, no, Brother Shirty, that's not right. I don't know why you'd say something like that. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You tell me where you've heard anybody here in the United States of America having a 500-soul revival in 30 days. Huh? This, you know what happened when they come down out of the upper room? 3,000 people got the Holy Ghost and got baptized in Jesus' name. We've lost something. Miracles. I don't know how often you folks have miracles. Do you know I am, I, I'm an old timer and uh, I, I've spent my whole life, my whole life. And of course, uh, with Brother Clark, Clyde, forgive me, I'm sorry, Brother Clyde. But Brother Clyde and Sister, Sister, uh, whatever her name, Langford, they know this. Sister Langford, especially uh, in in uh, Louisiana, in that old building. Listen, I I love going in there in my office, shutting the door, sleeping on the floor for days, just me and God. The only person to get to me was my wife. And do you know what my main prayer was? God, I want a relationship with you that I can pray for the sick and they are healed. That was my main request. I didn't realize it then, but I know it now. Sickness and salvation go hand in hand. I know, you're going to get quiet on me again, I'm sure. But I'll explain that to you maybe a little later. But sickness and salvation are neighbors. They're part of the same promise, part of the same word of God. If you don't believe it, just read James chapter five, read it all, and you'll see it in black and white right there in the word of God. But listen carefully to me, folks. We've got Pentecostals in churches that we call mega churches, 500, 1,000 people, 7, 800 people. They have never, I'm talking to some folks probably here today that have never, seen a devil cast out. Hmm? I'm telling you, we've been living in exile. I'm telling you, we've been living without demonstration. We've traded our demonstration for, for uh, uh, enticing words, fancy preachers and, you know, fancy uh, 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 messages and all. I don't have a fancy message. I'm here to tell you tonight that God's ready for you to rise up and say, I lost it. I lost it. Somebody help me. I want to get it back. I want what they had in the book of Acts. I want, the, I want what they had in the latter rain movement. I lost it. You're not going to get it back. I'm, I'm not playing. You are not going to get it back until you admit you lost it. <laughs> You're going to have to admit you lost it. And if you, if you feel like that's just saying too much and it's, it's uh, too indicting and, you know, it's embarrassing, it's just shirty and I, this past week, we, we pastored in Augusta, Georgia, 15 years. I was nothing but a kid, both of us. I think she was about 23 years old, and I was 24 and become a pastor. I don't advise that with anybody. Y'all missed it. 
we went there with about 25 people and went crazy. During that period of time, we had so many people getting the Holy Ghost, we couldn't count them in a service, every church service. We don't know how many people got the Holy Ghost. In about a three-year period, we went from 25 people to over 500 people. So you're not going to get my sympathy. You can have whatever you ask God for. Hallelujah. Whatever you decide. But back in the day, back in that day, God gave me revelation insight to one of the greatest, greatest revelations of all time. He showed me revelation insight to the work of his kingdom called Ministry of Saints. Ministry, this man may be called in five more full ministry, I don't know, but Ministry of Saints. Praise, are you a preacher? Yeah, you are. Every one of you's got the Holy, you got the Holy Ghost. You a preacher, all right? Now, you may not be in the five-fold ministry. You may not be a pastor, teacher, prophet, evangelist, or, or an apostle, but you are a minister, right? Every one of you. All of you. And that's what I was teaching back 25 years old, 26 years old, years ago. And uh, we had a lady come to the church, and it was jam-packed. Somebody said jam-packed jelly tight. I don't know. But, I mean, we were having church like this. People in the aisles, against the wall, down the middle. We had people everywhere, people. And the Holy Ghost was falling while the choir was singing, while the, while the preacher was going on, all of this. And uh, people just getting the Holy Ghost. Why? Somebody was praying. One night in that crowd, there was a lady came in, and uh, she was right off the street. She was bleached, blonde, as, as, as blonde as you could get. She was a poor, simple woman right out of the world. And I'm not criticizing bleach blonde. I'm just telling you about this lady. But she came in, she was seeking God everywhere she went, Catholic church, Baptist church, everywhere. She was seeking God. Every pastor, she would say, I want more than this, I need God. So one night she dropped in on our church and we were almost scratching the paint off the walls. I mean, nobody could sit down. It was up, down the aisles, middle, middle of the aisles, po folks getting the Holy Ghost, getting healed, having church. Scared her senseless. She left and said, that bunch of crazy people, I ain't never going back to that place. Started going to other churches, checking things out. And couldn't find it. And one day her teenage son who right now is a UPC preacher. His daughter is married to a UPC preacher. Hallelujah. Just outside of Augusta, Georgia. As a teenager, he dropped in on church one Wednesday night, and it was the same old stuff. We didn't care. We didn't care who was looking, who was there, who wasn't there. We went right on with, with what we did for God. He went home. He said, Mama, he said, you got to go back. Mama, that's where we need to be. They've got what you're looking for, Mama, and you need to go back again and check them out. She did. And after she went back the second time, she was there 50 years later. She was still in the church, still full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's not all. She was as simple as you could get. Five kids, single mother. The dad was an alcoholic, no help whatsoever. She went through torment trying to live and stay alive, pay her bills and, and get by from day to day. And uh, uh, she stayed in the church. And when I talked about ministry of saints, it was like she said, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank God for that. She wanted to hear it. And when she heard it, they called us last Thursday and they said, Pastor from Augusta, Georgia, I was headed to New Mexico and not Georgia. 
My wife and I had to hop on, hop on another plane. We flew out to Augusta, Georgia on Friday. Saturday, we had her funeral in a little, little town called Thompson, Georgia, where her son pastored and her granddaughter's husband pastored together. And I'm telling you, in a church that would seat about 300 people, her name was Margie, Margaret Biggs. And I'm telling you, I never thought Margaret Biggs was listening to anything I was saying. She just loved come to church, coming to church and worshiping God. So that day, they rolled her casket in before the pulpit. And there she lay after 50, more than 50 years of staying with the church and serving God. But I looked at that church that would seat about 300 people. And when I looked at the, there were people standing out in the foyer. There were people standing in the building, if I remember correctly. But what got me was that little simple woman, one to God, right off the street, out of the world. That little simple woman had one to God about one half of that congregation sitting in a crowd of more than 300 people. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why things were lively and that's why you couldn't sit still and people would run out the door. There was a woman in the church there Saturday during the funeral. My wife was sitting by her. She used to be my Sunday school secretary in the church back in Augusta. While sitting by my wife, she said, my God, I gotta get out of here. I, she's backslid. Listen, I'm here to tell you, we're not supposed to come in here with a dead, dull, boring Pentecostal church service. We're supposed to have a move of God. And if we've lost it, if you've lost it, it's time and for somebody to say, I lost it. I want to do whatever it takes to get it back. Woo! Oh! If you lose your prayer life, you're not going to get it back until you admit you lost it. And... You've got to get sick and tired of just going through the motions. Just going through the motions. Hallelujah. Am I, am I getting through yet? Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know why in the world you're standing out to me so much. I, I can't already get my eyes off you tonight. Praise God. You got the Holy Ghost? You got the Holy Ghost spoken tongues? been baptized in Jesus' name. You know something? There's some people God wants to introduce you to or bring you back to them that he wants them to find God through your life. And the only way it's gonna happen is through your prayer and your worship and your faithfulness and sub submission to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Anybody sitting in this crowd right now that before you come to church tonight, you were hurting and in pain and you, you almost didn't come to church, but you decided to come on anyhow, but you're, you're hurting and uncomfortable right now. Anybody in this house feel you do? Stand up, Mom. Can you do that? Praise God. All right. All right, we'll take that. Can You, you speak English? Good. All right. And the situation you're dealing with is dealing with is it personal or can you tell me what it is? It's personal. We won't. I don't don't want to talk about anything that. Yeah. Now I tell you what. Have you ever been filled with the Holy Ghost spoken tongues? Once. Okay. Okay. So way back then you got the Holy Ghost and spoken tongues. Now, did you know? That any time God heals a person, it's written in the book of James chapter 5, any time God heals a person, he forgives all their sins at any moment that sickness or pain goes out of their body, God forgives every sin in their life. Did you know that in the word of God? It's in the word of God. 
So what that means is, now God has allowed this to come to you so he could speak to you and give you a renewing in the Holy Ghost. Would you accept that? Now, what I'm going to do, now I'm going to lay my hand on you and I'm going to ask God to, con I've come here tonight with a message and I've said it's God's message for this church. It's time for this church to get back you individually get back whatever you may have lost in your relationship to God and have a visitation of God with great demonstration. Does that make sense to you? All right. So what I'm going to do, if God let this happen to you so that he could get your attention, when I lay my hand on you, the pain's going to go right out of your body. Okay? It's going to leave you instantly. And the instant that that pain goes out of your body, all you've got to do is lift your hands and start speaking in tongues because God will give you a renewing in the Holy Ghost. Right? Now, once again, do you believe if that, you ever, you ever been prayed for and pain went out of you right then? You ever had that happen before? All right. Now, I'm going to lay my hand on you and I'm going to ask God to touch this, dismiss this pain to confirm his message to this whole church. And I'm going to ask God to, I'm going to take authority over that pain and that problem and dismiss it. And when I do, I'm going to pray for you to be renewed in the Holy Ghost. And all you'll have to do is open your mouth and speak in tongues because God will have forgiven every sin in your life. Man, you don't have to. All I want you to do is open your mouth and just speak. When that, my God have mercy. I take authority over the pain. Ooh, ha ha, ha ha, in Jesus' name. I bind the sickness. I dismiss the pain. And in Jesus' name, I say, Lord, confirm your word to this woman and to this congregation. This is your message tonight. Confirm your word by healing this woman. Now receive you the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. Aha! Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of the Lord God, I take authority over that pain and I command it go. I dismiss it in Jesus' name. How do you feel? Any, do you feel any better? You're back. You could not stand up. And here you are standing. And God is ready to renew you and fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You let the Lord do that. All right? I am saying that every time you have church, you're supposed to have demonstration. And you're supposed to help make it happen. Praise God. You're, supposed to, you're not supposed to be waiting on the pastor. Praise God. Now, you talk to Sister Langford, she'll tell you about Brother Shirley and the way he acts. All right. Hallelujah. The point is, it's not enough to come here and, and listen to the music and sing good songs. And, and, and hear the, you've got one of the best preachers in Pentecost. You've got a couple in this church that love you. They love you. They can help you reach higher levels in your relationship to God. Praise God. But the point is, if you've lost the desire for your prayer life, if you have lost your uh, obedience to God in worship, if you have lost your faith, if you've lost your anointing, if you've lost your ministry, the point is you will never get it back. Until you say, Pastor, help me. I've lost it. I want to get it back. I want to get it back. Hallelujah. Now, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is in what I'm saying tonight. And I know, and my wife asked me earlier today, she said, what are you going to preach tonight? And I said, I have no idea. 
And before the evening was finished, I said, I have got to preach the things we've lost along the way. I've got to preach it. It's God's will. You want this building? You want Las Vegas to look you up, find out where you're at? You want, woo! Oh, hallelujah. A few days ago, and I'll get our keyboard person to come back. Praise God. A few days ago, I was in North Louisiana, and uh, I was going to do Sunday morning and Sunday night, and that's, that's about all, all I can handle. And uh, got to church that morning, and the pastor, thank you, I'm good. I got one. I was, I tell you what, you unwind. No, I can't do that. I'll, I'll be going into a, a, a choking seizure here in a minute. But pastor and wife, we've been friends for years, this shirty myself, and he come to me and he was going to do Sunday school and I was going to do morning worship. And he came to me and said, Brother Shirty, I got a problem. He said, we had a young man in this church. His mother still comes, but he backslid out of the church and went out in the world. And he married a girl and she is the daughter of a Baptist pastor. And uh, says she hates Pentecost. She hates the doctrine. She hates Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. She said, I will never, I will, don't you ever say I will never do that. Never speak in tongues, Holy Ghost, do all that stuff. So he said, Brother Church, she called me this morning. They have a little two-year-old boy. And said that two-year-old boy has kidney stones. I said, Oh, I've never heard of any such thing in my life. A two-year-old baby with kidney stones? He said she's coming in the Sunday school service. She's got to go home. She has an emergency, an appointment she's got to do during the worship. I said, I'll do it. So I preached a little bit, sitting back on my left, and I spoke to her and asked her to come. She come up. Her mother-in-law came with her. Her mother-in-law reached over and took hold of the baby. And uh, uh, I'll pick on somebody else's. She walked up there, and I looked at her, and I said, you know why your baby has kidney stones? Who is this? All right. You, are you, you going to the altar to pray for the Holy Ghost? It'll be all right. But other than that, it won't be. Okay, somebody help me because it's distracting right now. All right? All right. Once again, you talk to Sister Langford, she'll tell you, Brother Shirt, you don't have a brain. But I looked at this lady and I said, You know why your two year old child has kidney stones? I said, The baby is innocent. This child is not guilty of any kind of sin. He is living in a stage of total uh, non-accountability for anything. He don't even, he's not responsible for nothing. But I said, God gave your two-year-old kidney stones. He gave your baby kidney stones so he could talk to you. She had already said, I'll never be a part of any kind of Pentecostal church talking in tongues and dancing in the aisle, running around. I'll never do that. I'm a Baptist and that's okay. I, most of our congregation was made of Baptist folks. They make some of the best Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled people you've ever seen in your life. Compliment. And uh, I said, God let him have kidney stone. He was going to have surgery the next week. And God did this so he could talk to you. She looked at me and bit tears swelled up in her eyes. I said, will you believe that when I lay hands on this baby, when God heals this baby of kidney stones, he's also going to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost because God's trying to tell you 
that he wants you to repent of your sins, be baptized in his name, get the Holy Ghost talking tongues. Tears started to run down her cheek. I reached over and laid my hands on that baby. And when I did, I saw those kidney stones go out of that baby's body like a load of buckshot. <laughs> Went out of the, the child's body. And so I was praying for the baby right here. And I reached back and I was going to lay my hand on her and she went crazy. No, I don't mean she, she didn't have a fit. She went crazy. She went literally out of control, jerking and jumping. And, and she was talking in tongues so heavy, it scared me. I don't know what happened to her. I, I prayed for a lot of folks to get the Holy Ghost, you know, but I'm telling you, brother, God brought it all back in one, one touch. I called the pastor back. Two weeks later, I don't ever check on folks we pray for. I said, Pastor, what about that girl that had the baby with kidney stones? He said, the baby is healed, well, no kidney stones, no surgery. The baby is two-year-old out in the aisle, just jumping like this, you know, waving his arms. And he said, the mother is the first person to church and the last one to leave. And the backslidden daddy came back to God. I'm telling you, if you want to see something happen, get a demonstration in the midst of your worship and your faith and your anointing. Get back what has been lost to the apostolic movement over this generation. Let's get it back. Let's get it back. Oh, stand up with me, would you? Somebody else here tonight, sick or in pain in your body, did you lift your hand back there, Mama, back in the back just a little? Did you do that? Are you sick tonight? Come here. Come up here, will you? Can you do that? Hallelujah. What's your name right here? The stuff I'm doing right now is the stuff God wants you to do. All right? Are you sick tonight? Are you hurting in your body, in your head? your head, your face. You ever had God heal anything in your body like that? Okay. I'm going to lay my hand on you just like this. And the anointing of the Holy Ghost is going to flow through your body. Right now, I take authority over every pain in your body. I Find it and cast it out. Yes, you will go. Yes, you will go right now. In the name of Jesus, I lose this woman. And the Lord God has forgiven you and you can be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost right now in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and speak. And that's it. That, that, I'm telling you, there it is. It's coming right there. Woo! Come on, open your mouth. Let it speak out through you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm telling you, she is speaking in tongues. Oh, hallelujah. Praise, praise the name. Praise the name of the Lord God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah.